Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of those joining us here in the United States and around the world for Tailwind Business Ventures, our second live cast specifically on the topic of humanizing software. Uh, very excited to come back to you from last week's episode where we had a chance to visit with Harsha Balur, the CIO of James Avery. Today, we have an extremely exciting guest that I'm excited to have the opportunity to share with you guys today. And just a little bit more about um, what we're doing here with Tailwind is really embracing our people first mission, really about our software as a relationship and having just fireside chat type conversations with a number of technology and other leaders from different organizations and corporations around the globe, really about the impact of software and really humanizing software in particular. Please continue to join us every Tuesday at 11 o'clock Central as we talk with and engage with more and more leaders across the board. With that being said, it is my honor and pleasure today to introduce to everyone Yen Young, who is the CEO of Casoro Group, who is a single family real estate investment firm that has invested close to a billion dollars over the course of the last 15 years. More importantly, Yen was also one of the very first folks on Shark Tank back in 2013 and received at that time the largest investment to date for one of his earlier business ideas, the How Do You Roll franchise. Today, Yen is joining us to not only share his experiences and a little bit about his life, but also kind of talk a little bit about all things humanizing software. So Yen, thank you for joining us today. Hey, Andrew, how are you? I am doing very well. Thank you for asking. Certainly a pleasure to have a chance to, uh, as these conversations kind of happen and we're doing this live time between your house and my house, but having the opportunity to connect um, and not just connect with ourselves, but hopefully share some ideas and some thoughts, a little bit about the line of humanizing software, but a lot about us and kind of our thoughts in general and see how that might have an impact on others. So. As we jump right on in today, and again, thank you for joining us, would love to start off with a very simple question. Tell us a little bit of the Yin Young story. Uh, you can go ahead and put in whatever and everything that you'd like to, but tell us a little bit about your story and uh, um, what has led you here to join us today. So this is a five hour uh, podcast, is that right? <laughs> so I was born, I was born in, in 90, 93, uh, 73, 1973. <laughs> um, so actually I was born in China, uh, came over to the States when I was about a year old. So my, my, my parents brought us over, uh, uh, actually just the two of them and myself uh, very early on when I was about a year old uh, through Ellis Island into New York. And uh, so first seven years of my uh, six years of my life, uh, I grew up in uh, Manhattan, Chinatown. And uh, there, uh, that's kind of where the story really began uh, was, you know, watching my parents as immigrants come through and, and watching them work, uh, work themselves uh, pretty hard uh, to make it. Uh, and then finally, uh, my, my father said, you know what, this is, seems like a little bit of a dead end. And so he moved us to Houston, Texas. And, uh, and then, so that's where I end up growing up and uh, worked with them. Uh, my father moved there to work at a restaurant that was a referral from a second cousin. And uh, so that was the first, in, you know, into, you know, the industry of the, the restaurant industry for me, watching my parents go into it. Uh, and a few years later, my dad ended up buying the restaurant as an owner finance deal. So really, the American story is really on their shoulders, not mine. Uh, but anyway, so so then I ended up working with them. And, and so through that process, I started working in the restaurant industry around about eight, nine years old, pretty, pretty early on, uh, probably illegal. Uh, I, I you know, I <laughs> put ages on, let's just say when I was a young kid, <laughs> yeah, I sit there and I think about, you know, I was playing with a fryer <laughs> at the age of like, you know, nine or 10, uh, you know, cutting up vegetables with knives and, and, and cleaning dishes. I all I've sit there like, huh, you know, I think about it today and I don't know how well that would have worked out today. Uh, but, uh, that, that's kind of how, how the story started, uh, and, and got us going in, in America was really through, uh, you know, blue collar, you know, hard work labor. Uh, and so, uh, you know, over, over the years, they were able to, to have several restaurants, uh, retire early, uh, get uh, all me and my siblings through school. Uh, so 
Uh, they're, they're really a really interesting American story. I just got to get lived through that a little bit. Um, so, you know, the, 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 uh, the idea of having to like make it uh, was uh, on my shoulders because if my parents can make it not speaking English, there was no excuses for me, right? I, I, I didn't have any excuses. And so went to University of Texas, got a finance degree uh, and then, uh, and, you know, and then got into the, the world of finance and, and money and uh, did that for, for gosh, did wealth management for about 13 years uh, and managed uh, quite a bit of dollars there for, for different families and high net worth. Uh, and then uh, my brother and I got it, <laughs> my brother being a sushi chef, we, we decided we were going to change the world and uh, light, light the world up by creating fast casual sushi. So, you know, Chipotle did to the burrito, we were going to do with the sushi roll. <laughs> I have heard that from you more than a few times. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and somehow, you know, what's funny is I look around and it's like, oh, well, that, that whole idea kind of went away. It looks like everyone's into pokey now. <laughs> Slop it all in a bowl. It's a lot easier. You started it. You started it. <laughs> So, yeah. And then today, you know, now I've been doing uh, real estate and running the family office here at Casoro for about, gosh, coming on seven, seven years, soon to be eight years next year. So um, uh, no, no longer a spring chicken, uh, but still got plenty of energy to keep things going. <laughs> Outstanding. Um, I want to dive in a couple of different areas there. And I find it interesting that in the conversation that we had last week with Harsha, he mentioned specifically how his dad had a huge impact on his life as an entrepreneur. Um, he has a background having uh, uh, come, come over from India, um, and his dad was um, involved in a number of different entrepreneurial uh, exploits. Um, and it sounds like you had kind of a similar path associated with coming in from through Ellis Island and then getting over and finally making your way to Texas, where we're, of course, <laughs> very, very glad to have you. Um, but would love to dive a little bit deeper on that family connection side of the importance of family. I know this is something that we've talked about quite a bit. And as we talk about the humanizing software side of the equation, it always is important, I think, to talk about those connections, especially those connections with family and friends. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about your relationship with your mom and dad and that entrepreneurial spirit and how that might have led to all things with how do you roll and where you are now? Yeah, you know, that that's an interesting question because when I think back on it, I don't think it, it was one of those where my parents sat around and said, oh, we're going to turn you into an entrepreneur because that was definitely not the conversation. <laughs> when you're Asian, you only have like, three career paths, right? As an immigrant coming to this country, they're like, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, right? <laughs> or you're going to be an engineer. That, that's pretty much it. Like just pick one of those and 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 don't do what we did, right? That was so, so the intention of being an entrepreneur, actually, I don't think was actually there. It just, I think it happened through happenstance and, and the fight for survival. And so when I think back on my parents and, and what they had to do, they they were of the the thought process of okay you know the opportunity of being in this country is there what can we do we we don't have the education background we can't fit into those three you know doctor lawyer or engineer so what can we do and and so it was it was a fight for survival to say okay well we can learn a trade and in this particular scenario they learned the trade of of, of, of hospitality and food and and through that they started realizing that well maybe if I own the business, I do it a little different. And then maybe we'd make a little bit more. And maybe if I had my kids work for me, <laughs> free labor, I can make a little bit more. <laughs> you know, I think those are the ideas that were happening through that process. Um, but what's amazing is that when I think back on it, when we started having conversations as I got a little bit older, so I started managing the restaurants around age I want to say about 15, 16 years old, right, right closer to 16, uh, because it was right before I started driving. I started managing one of the restaurants with them. And through that process, that's where I really learned about business, because my parents would say something to the effect of, hey, you know what? Our, our food cost is a little bit high. And so what we might need to do is maybe what we should do is, you know, get whole chickens and we'll, 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 we'll cut it up ourselves. We'll add labor to it, but then we'll save on the cost of pre prep, pre prep chicken. That's cost of goods sold. <laughs> like, like I didn't think about it that way, but that's really what it was. Or they would say something like, Oh, you know what? Um, 
you know, we really need to, we need, really, we need to worry about our working capital because we have to pay these bills. And through that process, we have to worry about these bills. We can take a little bit longer to pay where well, these we have to pay right away because of supplies and that sort of thing. That was cash flow. That was cash flow analysis. Right. And so you don't realize these things that as a young person, you're talking these, having these conversations. It was just life. You're just having a conversation about like, how are we going to make this thing work? Right. And then you go through that and then you go to business school and you, they start talking about these things. And you're like, wait a minute, I, I've had this conversation before, <laughs> right? Oh, I get it. And then, and then you know, they, they had multiple restaurants and, and we sold some of them. And that the, the idea of valuation of a business, right? I learned that all before I even went to college, right? Because they sold two restaurants before I even went to, to, to University of Texas. And so through that process, I, I started hearing how they thought about how to value their business and what they would sell it for. And was based on the revenues and, and, and income and NOI, all these concepts that later I gave a label to at the, at the business school that I already knew in real life. And so so really, they, they taught me about business and, and, and really they were the first, you know, they were my first masters, if you will, <laughs> of, of getting good at, at, at business and, and just watching how scrappy they were. Right. And, and, and how they had to learn that there, nobody taught them, you know, NOI and, and, and IRR and all these financial terms that we learned later. They just they just figured it out through work. Right. And uh, and so to me, that's the greatest gift that they ever gave me. It, you know, when, when I was growing up, I was a little bit bitter about it. <laughs> I, I, I never went to homecoming. I never I never got to go to football games. I never went to a dance. Right. Um, and you know, my kids, they, they go to all the football games, Friday night lights. Right. Uh, but, but, but growing up, I had to work Friday was the busiest day. <laughs> I was expected to be at the restaurant. And, and so growing up, I felt like my, a little bit of a robbed of my childhood, if you will. But now when I look back, it was the greatest gift I ever got. It really was. That that's interesting. And I'm curious, did you ever have the conversation with mom or dad that said, Hey, mom and dad, I need a ride to the store to go manage your business. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just kind of thinking that through, um, and it's interesting, the lessons that we learn from our parents, um, I'm going to, um, my just literally last night. So um, we took my youngest daughter to join my oldest daughter um, at UTSA uh, where they just started classes yesterday. And there was a lengthy conversation and you can truly appreciate this as my um, oldest daughter, who is a senior, um, was uh, making the decision as to when she was going to start accounting 312. So uh, when yeah. you're talking IRR, and <laughs> all of the fun aspects of the business terms, um, let's just say that Lauren takes after her dad, where uh, accounting 312 was not my friend at all. Our <laughs> so um, we, I, I, I got through with a whole bunch of really, really good friends who had a, tal a talent for balancing the books and a whole bunch of other different things. But so we had a number of different conversations, um, and I have learned quite a bit myself uh, along the lines. And she was deciding, do I do this now? Do I wait till my last semester? This is going to be a heavy workload. And really trying to figure out kind of what, what she wanted to do with that. So I get a text last night um, that was, of course, um, the, demonstrative, the demonstrative nature of um, our younger kiddos. All text. Um, all <laughs> That's right. Um, that she had her first class, and she says, holy cow, she might have said something else. <laughs> I know accounting. And it had a whole bunch of different emojis and other stuff after it. And I said, that's great after one day. What do you mean? And so we talked last night and I had her help. Um, I have put together a little bit of a family estate plan for our family just to kind uh, of make sure that mm -hmm. the, the, everything was in order. And I had her help me with that a couple of years ago. Uh, she literally came back and said, Dad, I needed to tell you that when I did this two years ago or three years ago, whenever it was, that was the silliest, craziest thing that I thought you were ever going to have me do. But I will tell you, when I started and dove in on my first day of school, I'm going, I know what that is. <laughs> this was this and this, and, and it was great. And she says, I've got to give you props, Dad. And I didn't actually hear anything else after she said that, really. I just heard these <laughs> And, and, and the rest of the night was a blur. But um, that's great. It, it's fascinating what we learn from our parents. And yes. What we try and pass on to our kids. Yes. 
and and your story about hey i kind of missed out on my childhood is a gift that you're now giving to your kiddos with friday night lights with being able to go to homecoming those type of things so it's it's just i find it interesting on a number of different fronts um and as you were growing up so continuing the restaurant stint i would yeah. love to and i want to bring a little bit of technology into this because uh, under the under this theme of humanizing software um as you and your brother who is a sous chef were trying to figure out what you were going to do um and that you wanted to kind of um as the as chipotle did to the burrito um, <laughs> uh, do what let it roll did with uh, sushi um walk walk us through your planning associated with that what made that kind of come to fruition and how did that come about yeah so so bringing in the technology piece i will tell you that growing up the idea of bringing a computer so so you know i grew up in the 80s 90s right the idea of bringing a computer to work was like fascinating right that was like a big deal right it's not like today where we have the ipads and the laptops and that sort of stuff but i do remember bringing in a more digital a digital cash register that was like a big deal right that could calculate what the change should be without me having to do it in my head right like like <laughs> <laughs> that was a big deal when we first started with my parents, right? And then as as you looked at uh, as the years went by, by the time we hit the 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 mid to 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 late 90s, they actually had computers now, even for ordering systems, right? And then when you fast forward that even further, another 10, 15 years further out, when I look at how do you roll, we were technology driven across the board. There was not even a conversation of whether or not we would use technology or not. It was how were we going to use that technology and how were we going to make it more efficient? Because the idea was we got to get people through that line as quickly as possible. But I also needed the technology to help me run the business on the back end as well, too. And we were dissecting literally to the ounce of protein of you know, bluefin tuna or whatever it is, the ounceage of what we were going to put into the roll and to and how it had to be prepared. And it was all kept track of through software and and, and inventory systems. So, so yeah, the evolution. When you were in your teens, your parents were making the decision of whole chicken versus pre-cut chicken just based off of can we save a few dimes here that's right but now you've got the means with which for a very specific subset of your menu one particular item just one skew one yep. skew what that looks like and the cost savings just because of the ability to dissect and analyze and have more insight into what that looks like that's right that's right how did you guys and it sounds like it was incorporated from the get-go but how did you guys really um, come up with the idea and bring it to market? Well, it, it, it was a system. We had to build it, right? So it wasn't like, you know, when we first started, my brother being a chef, typically he's, he's much more into the art side and the, and, and, and the presentation of the sushi itself, right? But I'm much, much more on the finance and, and background side where I wanted to know what was the exact cost of a cup of miso soup, <laughs> right or 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 uh, uh, one one tuna roll right and 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 based on the ingredients we put in I wanted to know the food cost right and so we started working on okay the loin of tuna that we buy from whoever our distributor was comes in this size size package roughly right and we would weigh it and measure it and then we would input that information then we would say well how many strips did we cut that into what was the yield and we would put that information so it took time to build it. But the fascinating thing is that once you all you had to do then with software was adjust the pricing of what you would get the material for and everything would start calculating for you. So we would know literally, you know, almost to the penny how much a California roll cost us. That, that's brilliant. And I can tell you based off the number of California rolls I've had in the last few weeks because <laughs> I've got more than a few uh, favorite spots up here in, uh, um, in and around Austin. Uh, yeah. So um, that's just a good thing across the board. I'm, I'm hearing a theme here of the power of technology enabling not only automation, um, mm. but also better insights. Um, yes. Let's 
talk a little bit about that because, and I'll, I'll, I'll set you up for this because um, at Tailwind, one of the biggest things that we're doing on a regular basis is trying to leverage our software as a relationship model to whether we need to bring a few or a whole bunch of folks to help somebody uh, essentially make sure that they're taking something that might be manual, onerous, doesn't work, um, or is needs, frankly, to improve the customer experience. Mm -hmm. And that's where the whole humanizing software side of the equation really comes into play. And we've had the opportunity to work with a whole bunch of different folks with, hey, this is the way things used to be done. We're kind of leaning in, and especially over the course of the last 18 months with the many challenges everybody, especially restaurants, have had. It's yeah. changed, changed dramatically. I mean, yeah. just think of the, the drive up, the pickup, um, doing mobile alcohol ordering, uh, just the craziness and the what behind the scenes needs to happen to make that happen. Um, several different projects that we've been involved with. I'm curious from your side, and let's talk about the digital experience of what that would look like. With When you started off with how do you roll, it was all about the experience of making sure customers were able to do what they wanted to and get their built to order sushi. And you had the technology behind it to make it easy. Is that a fair encapsulation of that? And tell us a little yeah. bit. So, so because we were a franchise, one of the biggest conversations was consistency, right? Regardless, it's kind of like the Big Mac theory, right? Regardless of where you go, the Big Mac tastes the same. It, it works the same. Doesn't matter if you're halfway around the globe. It might not be the best burger, but you know exactly what you're expecting, right? So it's that consistency. And so one of the challenges was on the food side of it, trying to figure out how to make that work. But then the other side was also the systems and the software to make sure that those things were happening. So not only were we using technology from a tracking inventory cost analysis, we were also using it from a standpoint of uh, video monitoring. So we would actually have video monitoring, watching how they prep stuff. So, so the, the person that was prepping the tuna in, in Austin, Texas had to prep it the same way in Phoenix, Arizona, in, in, in Marina del Rey, California, in, 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 in Bahrain, you know, uh, uh, in the Middle East, uh, we had to keep that consistency. And so we, we had to find ways to, to make that happen. Uh, and so technology was the biggest uh, thread, if you will, to enable us to do that, right? Because the human element is there, right? Somebody cuts a little bit different, somebody portions a little bit off, those things start changing, right, in terms of the overall. And so we were we were having to monitor the the actual movements of people of how to actually make sure that the consistency was was there. That's got to be an amazing experience because, I mean, I walk into a restaurant and if it's a place that I've been to in another, so if it's a, if it's a franchise or if it's a chain, um, my expectation as a consumer is that if I order a sushi roll, if I order a burger, if I order whatever it may be, that the same type of experience that I had where I always eat is going to be the same type of experience when That's I right. eat that place in another spot. Yeah, It's noticeable to me when that actually is not the case, either because of the quality of the ingredients, the preparation, or, and I'll just kind of lump it into the experience. Um, mm. That's something that we're talking about quite a bit more is this whole experience from a customer journey perspective. Um, I would love to get your insights as to what you and your brother learned about the evolution of the customer experience with how do you roll? What does that look like? Well, uh, we learned that customer service is probably the most challenging thing. <laughs> Uh, what one person likes might not be the same as the other person. So, so you would think that you would say, well, consistency wise, this is how we would do it. And that, that, that hits the target, but then you, you're going to always have outliers of 10, 20%, 30% of the people that say, no, I don't like it that way. I liked it the other way or however it, it might be. And, and so that has always been the biggest challenge of whether it's the food industry or even what we do today in real estate, right? Where, where we're providing housing. Right. And so when you think about, all those components, um, the experience that you're talking about is, is so critical in, in terms of how you keep it consistent, right? Because the expectations once set is, is repeated and, and human beings work that way, which is this, this habitual pattern that we, we, we all generate. And so 
what I found was, and, and my brother and I had this conversation mul multiple times, is that how do we how do we keep everything the same and yet still have people working and still keep that the same and still be able to get all those components? And it, it was it was a battle. I, I can't say that we solved the, the problem. I said that we worked really hard on making everything consistent, right? Everything from having to go and check on stores and make sure that everything was done, you know, having them take pictures of things. I mean, whatever it might be, we, we, we did as much as we could. And even then, I hope that we were able to stay as consistent as possible, but sometimes it's just a little bit different. And I even found that with uh, Starbucks, for example, which I really admired their ability to, to keep things consistent. Uh, every once in a while, the Starbucks is just slightly off from, from, from what my, usual Starbucks experiences, right? Uh, and and so so it's always going to be a challenge and it's always going to be something that, that you have to work on. And I think technology just helps you. It's just a tool to assist you through that process um, and be able to, 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 to get there. Excellent. Um, we've got a question that's coming up that I think is a perfect one um, about translating the wisdom of traditional restaurateurs into effective restaurant software. Mm. So, this is a great question. Yeah. Typically, um, and you come obviously from a family that did the traditional path back when mm -hmm. there wasn't much technology into eight to 10 years ago where technology could actually be leveraged. Would love to get your take on that question um, from one of our folks that's listening in about the translation of wisdom as to what that looks like. Yeah. And I, I love, I love the question, right? Because even even as my brother who who's a who's a you know master chef sushi chef uh we have that debate because sometimes it's a, it's a pinch here and a, and 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 a throw of a little bit here and i just kind of eyeball it and i'm like no 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 we can't do that anymore right we're trying to build something here and so i remember early on in, in that, that conversation how do we how do we get that to to that point and at first we we had to start with manual logic right just kind of saying okay well when you say a pinch, what does a pinch really end up? Well, let's measure your pinch, right? We need that. We need, yeah. Everyone's hands are a little bit different. So your pinch of assault is a little bit different than somebody else's pinch of salt. And so we had to start working through the, those, those things. I think specifically to software is really how do you build tools that can then systematize all those things so that somebody can say, you know what, for our formula, this is how we look at it. And then you can translate that formula across the board. And you know, tech people, I think of all people know uh, that your whole world is zeros and ones, right? At the end of the day, it's all zeros and ones, very binary. But now where you you, you, you get, you know, people like uh, Tailwind and et cetera have really taken uh, technology is really now machine learning, AI. And, 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 and now you start seeing that zeros and ones can actually turn into thinking processes. And I see traditional restaurant where you say, okay, the focus is on the food, et cetera, but the best chefs, they can repeat and build more and more restaurants because they actually break it down into a process and a system. And so you will find that they will create a dish, but they will know exactly how to replicate that dish and get other people to replicate that dish over and over and over again so that their signature dish can be repeated over multiple restaurants, multiple people, et cetera. I think the software piece of it a lot of times is used through that process is from a restaurant perspective where I see the biggest usage of software and technology is on several fronts. One is on the ordering front, right? So you see the, the, the Uber Eats today, you see the door dashes, right? And that's on the ability to get the ordering process going. We have an expectation today because of where technology has gone of what that interface and that usage should be. So I think it's always important to always go back to what the traditional restaurant tours thought of, which was customer service, customer interaction, customer experience, right? And building software for that goes exactly the same way. So to that question, I really feel like you always have to be able to think about it from the perspective as, as the user. And you guys call it the end user, I think is how, how you <laughs> technology people use the term, right? I just think of, uh, of the person, the common person that's using it. And I say, okay, does this logically make sense, right? I'll give you a great example. Um, being a busy person, oftentimes I order Jimmy John's. And, and the reason I use Jimmy John's is because they're very fast, they're very, they, you know, not healthy, but, but healthier uh, and, and relatively quick. But I found some flaws in their ordering app, right? So for example, 
when I order iced tea, I like it to be half sweet and half unsweet. But there's no option for me to do that anywhere. I can't even put a note, right, to make that happen. <laughs> so, 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 so when you think about those little things, that's where the software has to be more intuitive, right? Something as simple as that. Now, I also love boba, and then I know there's talks of boba shortages in the world and whatnot, but I love boba. There's probably a good reason for that, right? Something about those tapioca balls, right? So when you think about ordering there, they literally give you an option for uh, light ice, heavy ice, half sweet, quarter sweet, uh, you know, cream, no cream. I mean, like it, it, you, you start thinking about that. Now imagine the software of how to actually implement that customized drink, right? Which then is just one drink, which then has to go to the back, which then they have to hit the mark on the sweetness level, the ice level, the amount of, uh, uh, of tapioca they put in it, et cetera. That's the translation that has to happen between the traditional like, okay, I heard your order and I just kind of know what I'm doing versus the software that has to come into play to make that translation and, and that communication piece go back, right? So I love uh, several different themes there that I took away from um, and the customization of the customer experience, the frustration of, and we I think we take it for granted that when you go into a Jimmy John's, and uh, my family is a big fan of them as well, you're going to get consistency of experience. Yep. But the way, if you're in a rush, you're going to have your sandwich in probably three or four minutes. That's um, right. And it's going to be pretty consistent. But when you're trying to do that from an online software experience perspective, and you've given a, a, an, Arnold, an Arnold Palmer a mix of sweet tea or tea and lemonade. Yeah. It might not be an option, but maybe. That's right. Be. So how do you make that happen? I, I, it's a huge challenge and it's easily handled in a verbal conversation when you're yes. making an order, but when you're on an app and you're trying to actually figure out, hey guys, I want an Arnold Palmer, I want my you know half and half or whatever else it might be. And it might be a cause for you to bail and That's not, right. not, not have Jimmy John's that day because the customer expectation wasn't managing or matching the customer experience. That's and, exactly right. And that's something that we touched on last week with Harsha about um, a number of the issues about fear of tech. Mm. It comes up quite a bit where um, everybody says whether it, nobody likes it when they're always way of logging into their banking system or their way that they used to order or the way that they used to be able to accomplish some tasks possibly has changed because somebody somewhere thought that it might be better to do it this particular way. Mm. And some people just in general don't like to leverage technology. Um, and it differs, of course, we've got our younger generation, the generation Z, who's growing up now on FaceTime. And it's not unusual for their expectation to be when they have a conversation with somebody over the phone, it's not a this kind of a conversation, it's a, <laughs> this kind of a conversation. That's and, right. And you put your phone and put it there and then you might lay it down so somebody else is looking at the ceiling, supposed <laughs> to be looking at you, but that's the new way of kind of talking and the new expectation of that. Um, I'm curious about your take in uh, as it pertains to this fear of technology adoption mm. versus leveraging technology to help. Would love your personal experiences on what you've been able to understand about fear of versus adoption of. You know, that's a great question. You know, I, I think about the industry that I'm in now, which is real estate, right? We're talking about uh, apartment complexes, uh, homes, condos, that's that sort of stuff. And and that is still a very much a more traditional type business. It, uh, and and it's not a, a kind of a it's, it's an old old money, you know, type type of feel to it. What's amazing to me is that um, when you look at the technology required today, I'll give you an example. Um, we, we, we manage a, let's call it a 300 unit uh, apartment complex, right? In the old days, when we did that, the way we would do it is that we would have X amount of people uh, in the office and X amount of people working uh, on the property outside for maintenance purposes and, and grounds purposes. When you look at that, the way we used to sign up for a lease, right? People who had to sign up for a lease, 
we would have to print these forms, <laughs> pages and pages and pages, and people would have to sign in. Here's a fine print, and then you got to you sign here, and I got to make a copy of this, and and blah blah blah. Today we don't do that anymore, right? What used to take three people to do to sign up a lease, today takes like half a person because they're just monitoring it on an iPad because somebody did it on the iPad, right? <laughs> like, oh, oh, yeah, flip, flip, flip. Okay, here, you know, sign here. Literally, you're signing on the iPad. Great, next one, check, check, check. And during COVID, we actually did it virtual. People literally picked their apartment. So it used to be you had to tour the apartment, right? You have to say, oh, we'll come to this unit. I'll unlock it, blah, blah. We don't, we don't even have to do that anymore. We just say, okay, show up at this time at this unit. I unlock it from wherever I am. You don't know where I am. It opens. You walk through it, right? Or we're on FaceTime together and we're walking through it, either one. And then when we're done, we're going to do it all virtual. Say, you want that unit? Great. Here's 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 here, here's an email to a link and we get it all done. You upload your, 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 your driver's license, all of that stuff. So to me, if, when you think about how technology has made those things better and easier. Um, the fear of technology, because it's scary, right? Because the first thought was like, wait, you're just going to unlock that apartment and let a stranger walk in there? That's kind of scary, right? You're like, oh, that, what if they mess it up or whatever? No, we, 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 we've already, we've overcome all those, right? Um, I also thought about the first time I, I took an Uber. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, who is this person rolling up? Okay. I, okay. The license plate matches <laughs> and the picture of the profile is that person, but I don't know if he's a serial killer or not. I'm sitting in the back. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, but yet now I, I don't even think about, you know, when I, I call a Lyft or call an Uber. Right. And, and I'm completely comfortable with that technology. Can bad things happen? Yes, they happen regardless of technology. The technology is not in necessarily enabling it. Actually, to me, it's making it safer, right? Because I can visually see a lot of those things, right? Whereas in the past, I couldn't monitor it. Now I can monitor things that I couldn't monitor before, right? Because of technology. And so I, I understand the fear of that. And, and I understand that, you know, the new generation, they don't think about it because it just always was, right? It, it's like us having a microwave <laughs> or a cordless telephone. Remember the cordless telephones? <laughs> Pull the antenna out. <laughs> you, <gotta laughs> uh, you know, so so it, it just is. But then for, 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 I think for the older generation, there is a fear factor there. Uh, and, 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 but if you can make it user friendly, you, you can make it easier to use you'll see the adaptation happen regardless. Um, I think about my parents, right, who are in their 70s now, uh, 70s, and they use iPhones and iPads, and my, I saw my mom wearing an iWatch. I was like, oh my God, I don't even have an iWatch yet. She's like, oh yeah, your brother gave it to me. I love it. I didn't realize it did that. I'm like, how do you make it work? You're like, oh yeah, we can translate it all to Chinese. We don't even have to know English to do this. I was like, wow, wow, technology, right? And, and initially, I think there was a fear of like, well, I'm old. I don't know how to use technology. But now that fear is gone, right? And and I can look at pictures. I can I, I know what an emoji is, right? That's that's universal. That's, that's, not, that's not based on anything. And so I, I think that that fear factor uh, subsides once the adaptation happens. Uh, and and it just, for some people it takes longer to adapt, and for some it just is, and you just go with it, and 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 you move along, right? And so, um, you know, I don't think fear is the I don't think fear is the factor of why technology wouldn't just continue on. I, I don't see it. That's an excellent excellent point on that, Yen. And I'm going to go back to the customer journey that is really a part of your current work at Casoro on the multifamily side of the equation. Um, and I've actually lived this um, with my kiddos um, going through the now online document review. And yeah, yeah, to get an apartment, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Either even online housing, excuse me, even on campus housing, um, everything's done online now. It, it, it's kind of crazy. And you mentioned where previously you had to show up, hopefully the, uh, the apartment manager was there. Yeah, there was something to see. You called on your phone and made an appointment and you showed up and they took you to and you had to go through that and rinse and repeat if you needed to see different That's right. apartments, different locations. All of that just takes time. It takes energy. It takes effort. And it's a very manual kind of 
old school way of doing things. Yeah. Now, and we're seeing it especially with the real estate market here in Austin, it's crazy where people are buying houses, maybe sight unseen or That's right. a couple of photos online, which hopefully remotely approximate the current condition of the house. Um, and they're literally committing a substantial portion of their income with all through their device. And you're remotely locking and giving access to somebody, which is kind of crazy. And yes, what are they going to do in my house or in this apartment? Um, and then you're going through the approval process, which previously yeah. took three people, now takes 0.5. Of That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the entire process of, oh, by the way, let's get a notary involved and let's sign and make sure we're going to be closing and this needs to be done in purpose. And by the way, bring three pens because two of them are going to run out of ink. <laughs> and, and the whole process, it, it's, yeah. it, it's crazy from what we think about. And it wasn't that long ago that no. that, that was still the way to do things. That's right. That's but right. Te te technology is enabling that. And yeah. I love your comment about the enablement side of the equation. One of the things that I'm curious of, of your take on as well, because we're always talking about this humanizing side. Mm. We make it so easy now. Mm. You can order food online. You can get an apartment online. You can open up a new banking account online. It's so easy, just the power of your device. Love to get your take on maintaining the human connection aspect. Of mm. So it's easy to not <laughs> have to meet an apartment. Yeah. It's easy to not have to have a notary there present. That's right. That's it's right. It's easy to not have to coordinate this in-person people aspect of things. Mm. So how do we, as we continue to leverage automation, how do we enable the humanization side, the actual personal connection side of that to occur? Would love to get your take on that. Yeah, that's a great question too. And, 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 you know, do we become robots or socially distanced people because of technology? And I, I understand why you're asking that question. And, you know, that it brings to mind really what, for example, uh, upside Avenue, which is our, our REIT that we have, which, you know, the whole idea of the REIT was to allow uh, accredited and non-accredited investors to invest in commercial real estate, to open the market up and allow anybody that wants to, to invest uh, into, into real estate so that it's not just a rich person's game, right? Well, we had to use technology to make that happen, right? And so we had to open that up. And so the access, because we built the technology, made it easier. So anybody with you know $2,000, $10,000, $100,000, a million dollars, it didn't matter. You could just send us that money through the, our process, right? All online. When I go through that now, the question is, well, how do I trust this, right? I'm just going through the website. I'm just going through and I'm giving you how much money, right? All, all the way through. And, and $5,000 might be a little for some people, but a lot for other people. And how do I know that all, all those pieces are okay? The human aspect is that we use the technology to pop up a live chat box. Now I heard that though, those are now auto roboted too. Right. But ours is actually still live. Like literally it's a person here in the office right here in Austin, right in my office right here. And that pops up and they truly have a real dialogue with a human being. What we found was that a lot of people are OK using the technology for the access to get through it. But when it comes to service, they still like human interaction. They still like human interaction. So they will use first the technology side of the inquiry and they say, contact us and they fill out a box and send us uh, an email, right? It comes back to us in an email format. Then when it comes to us, if we don't respond within literally a, a, a 24 hour period, they'll call, <laughs> they'll actually call the 800 number and call us. And, 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 and that then goes through a routing process. But the way we've designed it is to, you know, let's not do the routing process. Let's just have somebody answer the phone. So if one person doesn't pick up, it rings to another phone until somebody picks up. So we're still using technology, but we're trying to give the human touch and the human element to the consumer quicker, right? And so when, what I find is that even on something as crowdfunding as an upside avenue, you know, REIT or, or whatever, we still have to add the human elements to it, but we still use technology to make that human element touch more efficient, right? Because we're, 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 we're or uh, uh, developing levels of response for the human need, right? Because if it's something like, hey, I just had a question, well, then then the slower the human response to that. 
it may be even automated to some degree. You know, here's an FAQ or what, whatever it might be. But then when it's like, hey, I need to get my money out or, hey, I'm trying to put more money in. Boom. The, the, the elevation of the human touch increases. And I think technology is part of that question of like where, where, where is the, the levels that we're, we're, we're dealing with? And then where do we interject the human uh, elements to it? Because there, 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 there's still something about just having somebody live talk to you. Right. And I think that that's still a big part of it. Um, and so I think that technology can actually help that. Now, I don't know, you know, you guys are really smart with your technology and I don't know one day you might have a, a, a robot actually talking to me and I won't know the difference between a real person and a robot, right? I don't know when Skynet gets consciousness. I don't know when any of that's going to happen. <laughs> but I actually truly do believe that the human side of it is still there, uh, even with the technology. And, and we find ways to still make sure that the connectivities are happening. This is obviously a topic that's resonating with some of our live viewers right now, um, as there's a number of questions that are coming in about it. Um, one of those that's quite interesting is, um, how do you preserve the deeply human experience? And we kind of talked on this a little bit about walking up to a Jimmy John's restaurant. That's easy from a fast yeah. perspective. But when you're going to a nice sit down dinner and you have a deeply human experience of the quality of actually meeting a maitre d' or a hostess or a host, that's mm -hmm. taking you to your particular table, and then you're greeted by whoever your waiter or waitress may be, or the folks that are going to be interacting with you. How do you preserve that deeply human experience of physically going to a restaurant to now enabling that to be fulfilled from a digital experience perspective? Would love to get your take on that. Yeah. So, so, so I think that 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 question is answered through also function of time for us, right? What I think what we tend to have happen is that when we want something quicker, faster uh, to serve a certain need, we tend to want less human contact for that because it's it's instantaneous, right? It's the ramen noodle, right? It's it's not I'm going to go to you know Jinya Tatsuya and have like a sit down. I'm just going to do ramen noodle, right? And I don't need any interaction. But there is an, an other side of us when we have more time to enjoy right? We tend to want more human interaction and more, you know, socialization when it comes to a, a meal or, or, or food or, or that sort of thing. And so when, when you start pivoting from like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to order it on Uber Eats. It shows up at the door. I pick up, I eat. It fulfills a need. I don't need that human interaction. When it comes to, I want to enjoy a good bottle of wine. I want to have good conversation with my wife right? I want to know what the specials are for the evening. I want to know why this, you know, the chef did what they did. That, that, that part of it cannot be fully digitalized, I don't think, right? At least not from my experience, right? What you can do is make it more interesting. So for example, you're already doing that today by using a QR code, right? Even at a fancy restaurant because of COVID, you're using a QR code than the traditional menu and then somebody, but the, the wait staff is still there, right? But the wait staff is actually taking your order on a handheld now, right? Which is very different than before. So the technology piece might be more for efficiency on the back end, but the interaction piece of it is probably harder to, to substitute. Until, again, until robots can, can be more like human beings, it's gonna be a harder, harder challenge, right? Because, you know, I, I think about my days of waiting tables. Uh, you know, one of the best ways to to do your job well as a waiter is actually a quick, clean joke every once in a while, right? Make them laugh a little bit, right? Uh, and 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 that sort of stuff is a little bit harder to replicate from a digital experience, right? And I would almost separate the two where there is the there is the need for the digital, where look, I'm just going to touch screen this thing. I get a number when it's time, I pick up my number, I never talk to anybody, I move on, right? Maybe at an airport where I'm in a hurry, right? But then there's the other times where I need human interaction, right? And, and I don't wanna substitute that because that's the quality of experience that I'm looking for. Can technology still be part of that conversation? Absolutely, it's just different, right? I, I love the concept behind that because to me, I think it depends upon the motivations of the actual customer. That's right. Are That's they right. seeking a transaction, which is, hey, I'm in a rush. 
I need to go to Schlotsky's. I need to go to Jimmy John's. I want to order it. I want to do it from an app that's going to allow me to order my Arnold Palmer um, and tell me when it's ready and be able to walk in, walk out so that I can get back to my day. That's that, right. That's transactional versus, as you had mentioned, hey, I want to hear what the specials are. And I agree with that. I love when you go to a very nice restaurant and you've got a, a, a very highly trained waiter or waitress that has been doing their job for some long period of time. And they're able to rattle off literally in a very conversational manner about here's the five specials of the evening and here's what it's going to be. And it just enriches the experience. It, it's that interaction, that, that uh, ability to be able to reach out and say to Sally, your waitress, or Frank, your waiter. Um, so tell me a little bit more about the halibut. I want right. to hear a little bit more about that. And it, it's, that, it's that immediate, real-time, authentic feedback that isn't quite there from a digital experience perspective. But I think it's a, a weighing of the transactional nature versus the experiential nature of, of what that kind of looks like. Yeah. And I think my, my, my thought is that it can be both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both, right? So in, in some instances, I think that um, having technology is really helpful. But in other aspects, I think that human interaction is very helpful. And I think where those two, and maybe that's the whole point of humanizing software, right? Is that if when those two work together, that might be providing the best experience, right? It's, it's the intersection of how do you make it um, meet your needs from a fulfilling transaction perspective while also meeting or frankly exceeding your needs from an actual experiential perspective as well. That's right. I love that. I love that take in. That's, um, uh, that's, quite possibly why you were so successful and just about everything. <laughs> so I love that. Um, there's this, there's this concept that we've talked about that's called people driven tech, three words, people, people, people driven, driven tech. tech. Okay. When that comes to mind for you in that specific order, people driven tech, what does that mean to you? Yen? So, so, to bring back the food analogy, um, I that the first thought was uh, chef-driven menu. That was my first thought when you said that. Okay. And, and so, what does that mean to a lot of people, right? So, what is what is the difference between a chef versus just anybody just cook, right? There is an inspiration. There's a vision there, right? So, so a chef brings a vision and brings a thought process and a creativity to it. When you say people driven software, I think the first word is people, right? So whatever is driven, which is the technology, it comes from a people perspective. It doesn't come from a technology perspective of what can be accomplished there, but rather from a people perspective of what needs to be accomplished from that side, right? And so no different than chef driven menu versus just McDonald's, right? That's not chef driven. It's just a process, right? So when I think about people driven technology, I think, OK, then it must be that it is there to serve the needs of the people first. Right. That's the first word. And that's the most important process driven, meaning that the people are driving it. And then the outcome is the technology. Right. So in the chef driven, the outcome is the menu, but it's driven by the vision of the, the chef and the, the menu itself. And then what comes out of that, right? So that to me is what I'm hearing when I hear people-driven uh, technology or people-driven software. That's excellent. I love the emphasis and the, the purposefulness of having the people aspect of that. And it gets back to the humanization side of the equation, that, that careful balance between we want to make things easy, you might want to make things secure because yep. we're sure that, again, if you're walking into an apartment, or if you're opening up a new account, how do you make sure that Andrew is Andrew or Yen is Yen? And there's a whole bunch of different debates uh, that are particular to identity theft and identification and verification and all different types of components that are specific to that. That is a problem to be solved. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a very important aspect to that. So I love the concept of people driven technology as it pertains to the emphasis first on people doing the driving to really emphasize the experiential nature of that. Yeah. I would be remiss if I did not ask that I 
and we've had this conversation, but that was just you and I, I think it was probably when we first met 10 years ago, eight years ago, whatever it was. Um, love to get your perspective. When you were live on Shark Tank, you knew, <laughs> you knew it was coming. I had to ask. Yeah. Um, what was the coolest or most scariest, terrifying part of literally being in front of, and literally as the show was just getting its start and really starting to become a hit, yeah. what was the coolest or most scariest part of that process for you? I, I think there's a couple of moments and, and I think it's important for, for, for most audiences to realize that what you see on TV, so on our episode, I think the part that we were in front of the sharks for was a total of eight minutes. If you, if you see it on, I think it's on Hulu and on YouTube and all that stuff now. Uh, but eight minutes, the actual time that we were in front of the sharks was closer to 90 something minutes. Wow. So that tells you that what you see on TV is a small, small fraction of what actually happens. And what actually happens is that in the, in the background, all the stuff that gets cut out is really where all the business discussions actually happen. And, and, and of course, to, to, to their credit, they, they, they have created a show that is business esque, but it really, you don't get any of the real business side of things. Right. I mean, we, they give you a flavor of it, but none at all. So my favorite moment was I get that we, you know, my brother and I, we walk out, there's a little blue tape that you have to stop at. <laughs> and then they say you have to actually pause for like X amount of time. And then all of a sudden, boom, it just starts. Right. And, uh, and then, you know, they just say you have to in your head count to 10. And then when you count to 10, you start your pitch. You're like, that's kind of how it works. Right. So you stand there. It's really awkward. You're staring at, you're staring at the sharks. They're staring at you. 10 seconds goes by and then you go, hello, sharks. You know, my name is, yeah, yeah you just got to go. And so, so, so to me, that was a really kind of a neat part of it. Right. But my favorite moment was actually, we get into the discussion immediately and Mark Cuban, right. Immediately goes, whoa, 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 whoa. How'd you come up with your valuation? Right. How, you know, business aside, Man, that's a big number. That's the biggest number we've ever heard. How did you come up with that valuation? I said, oh, well, you know, I used the discount cash flow model. This is where we are. And he said, OK, well, so what did you use for this? And, and what's the average sales there? And for 15 minutes before anybody else got into it with us, we were just talking about valuation, discount cash flow model, blah, blah, blah. He finishes and he goes, that is the best presentation of somebody that knows their valuation and understands discount cash flow model that I have ever seen on this show. But I don't want to be in the sushi business, so I'm out. <laughs> so guess what they put on the show? I don't want to be in the sushi business, so I'm out. 15 minutes of real discussion just cut, right? Yeah. And, and, and to me, that was one of my favorite moments behind the scenes that no one will ever know and ever see other than my brother and the other sharks. But but uh, that was one of my favorite moments uh, on the show. So this behind the scenes look at Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. No, I, yeah. I know that we've had several different conversations about that, and I'm sure it was an absolutely interesting learning experience. I've been on both sides of the give me your pitch in 30 seconds or <laughs> your lightning round or whatever, both doing the pitching as well as doing the listening to folks yeah. pitch um, on a whole hope for, for years. I've had the opportunity <laughs> to do that. Um, much, much prefer the listening side. Than the <laughs> side. So significant props to you for what you were able to do on that. Um, as we wrap things up today, Ian, I would love to get any parting thoughts that you might have really about the impact of humanizing software, what that really means to you and anything that you'd like to share with those folks that are listening today. Wow. Um, yeah. So I guess my, my final thought is that I, I think technology is important. Uh, I, it's not something that is a uh, give, a, a take it or leave it type scenario. Uh, I think, but it is important to understand the humanization of that technology and understand the human aspects of technology. Uh, because it is the tools that we need uh, to improve our lives as human beings. And so I think that this is a very relevant conversation of, you know, not building technology for technology's sake, but building technology for humankind and, and for human sake. Uh, and ultimately, that's the, the most important uh, aspect of the work that you guys are doing. 
Well, I appreciate that. And it is something that's very specific as to literally the why behind yeah. the particular podcast. It's all about people first. We talk about people driven technology. Um, and it's frankly in our tagline at Tailwind about software as a relationship. Um, yeah. Everybody knows software as a service. Everybody knows infrastructure or platform or maybe has heard of and maybe not even understand what that means, but it's everything as a service. And that's great. But from a tailwind perspective, we're literally doing exactly what you and I are doing today, having the opportunity to enjoy the aspects of the true connection of a relationship, the humanization of an ideally we'd be sitting together in the same room doing this, um, but we have the luxury of being able to do it from your office and my home. Um, but I think it's very, very important as we think about this people driven tech and our focus from a tailwind perspective of it's not business. It is personal, which is kind of our sub tagline that has enabled us to be able to do those things that we have. So um, thank you so much, Yen, for joining today. Absolute pleasure. Um, I certainly enjoyed hearing different parts of your story that I had not heard before. Um, I also certainly appreciate you sharing your insight and wisdom from your life experiences with us. And for those of us who are listening um, or are going to have the opportunity to listen uh, before or after uh, today's conversation, uh, we, we wish you a very, very safe afternoon or evening or morning, depending upon wherever you're, uh, wherever you're listening in from. And please, please join us next Tuesday at 11 o'clock Central as we have a conversation with Manolo Almagren, who is the Managing Director of Q Division, a global digital ad agency specifically focused in on, again, this humanization of software. So, Yen, thank you again. We certainly appreciate your time and hope you have a safe and blessed week. My pleasure. Keep up the good work. Thanks thank so you. Much.